Welcome to the Lever Movement Podcast. I am your host, Brad Miles, co-founder and CEO of Lever. And with me today, we have Steph Clutterbuck, professional triathlete. Steph, how are you? Hi. Oh, that's really cool being introduced as professional triathlete. I'm very well, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's see. You're 10 months in to being a professional triathlete technically or a little longer? Uh, I think it's actually less. January, beginning of or middle of January was when I uh, officially got my pro card. So I don't even know what that is now. I feel like 2024 has been equally long and short. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, before we started recording, you were making uh, the comment that you don't even know what day of the week it is anymore because mm -hmm. it's just training. And Training Peaks tells you what day of the week it is. So. Exactly. Tra training Peaks is my life. Uh, it tells <laughs> me what day it is. It tells me what I'm doing. And other than that, it doesn't matter. <laughs> So um, since it is October 15th, technically exactly 10 months. Yeah. Yes. If we're talking mid-January. Mid yeah. So how have the first 10 months of being a pro gone? It's been a whirlwind. So I, I, I made the decision to turn pro in October last year. So gave myself like two or three months to one check that it was the right decision and to plan um, before kind of really going for it and it has been better than I could ever have imagined it feels as though I've gone back to my childhood dream of being a sports person and I'm living it and yeah. I kind of let go of that dream on two different occasions and now I'm back at the age of 30 doing it and it's like oh wow okay this is cool so I'm forever grateful for all of the decisions that have led, led to me being here right now, but I definitely don't take it for granted that I get to do what I love, travel the world, race really hard. Yeah, that's it's, so good. Yeah, that's awesome. And we'll dive into all that stuff. Um, and clearly you've had a, a good year, first year as a pro, second Ironman Chattanooga a couple of weeks mm -hmm. ago. Super exciting. So we'll talk about all that, but can you just give us, you know, the 30 second, 60 second intro to like who you are what you've been doing before you were a pro and just that the whole life. Yeah. Which, like, sure. This is more than 60 seconds. So take as long. Yeah, as I was going to say 60 seconds. <laughs> that is pressure. Um, so I, I'm a lifetime athlete. I think it's probably the best way to describe it. I, I grew up as a swimmer, um, swam for 10 years, gave my life to it growing up um, and decided that I was going to go to university and I wasn't going to swim anymore. Um, and I wasn't going to do sport because I, you know, your rebellious teenage years, um, went to university and started rowing and loved it. So then I rowed for six years of my life. So, you know, then I'm mid twenties, uh, having done two sports, um, all in <laughs> to, to say the very least, but I'd actually, uh, I managed to give myself quite a severe back injury as a rower. So I herniated two discs in my spine, trapped a nerve, uh, down to my left foot and, I'd, I had dreams of going to LA um, mm. and it very quickly became apparent that neither my mind nor my body was going to get there. So mid twenties, I retired from a sport for the second time. And at that point thought that it really was it. Like who, who, who picks up a sport in their mid twenties and becomes successful <laughs> was all I was thinking. I was like, you know, this is it. I'm going to go and get a corporate job. I'm going to settle down and have the life that I've been told that I should be having all through my academic career. Mm -hmm. And on a whim, signed up to do an Ironman because leaving the sport of rowing the way that I did, I just needed a challenge. Like I needed to do something to prove that I could do hard things. And an Ironman looked like a really hard thing to do. Mm -hmm. So why not? Like I'll teach myself to ride a bike properly and I'll teach myself to run and I knew I could swim. Um, so 12 months later, August 2019, did my first Ironman. Uh, distinctly remember thinking it was the worst day of my life and that I was never going to do another one. <laughs> um, and within about half an hour of crossing the finish line, I decided that I absolutely had to do another one because it was the best thing ever. Um, and that was that was the start of like my age group career, I suppose. So I, I still had a full time job working at a people consultancy so it was a business that was fully invested in taking lessons from sport and high performing sporting institutions and bringing them into business so for me it was it was a wonderful period of my life where sport and my 
working world had combined to get the best out of me. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it was it was it was great. And everyone at work loved to hear about what I was doing, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then the pandemic hit and everything combusted, basically. Mm -hmm. um, training was great because there's nothing else to do. And I didn't have a job anymore. Um, but it gave me the clarity that I needed to kind of focus on training, get better. Because I really wasn't very good the first time I did an Ironman. Hmm. Like, I, I wasn't one of these people that came in and, like, won their age group in the first try. I think I was, like, 25th in my age group or something like that. You know, it was way, way down. Nothing particularly spectacular. Finishing was the main aim. Um, and, yeah, October 21, I came in and and then won one overall age group. I'm in Portugal and I was like okay this yeah. is cool like <laughs> this is great <laughs> I can do this um and we've just been on a three-year journey since then like got to the point that I've gone self-employed with work and that's given me the freedom that I needed to turn pro which is super cool but I, like genuinely my life has always been sport and mm -hmm. this is when I'm at my happiest when I'm living and breathing the yeah the life of the sport that I'm doing. Yeah. And, well, so I feel like COVID was a pretty pivotal moment for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, for you in particular, like, did you, I don't want to get too personal, but like, did you get laid off during that time because consulting just wasn't happening in person or like, yeah. Was yeah. So I, I did. I was made redundant. Um, it was a lot, as so many people were. Yeah. Um, and, it was terrifying because both me and my partner at the same, within a week, mm -hmm. uh, the week of my birthday, of course, um, we both found out that we weren't going to be working the jobs that we were at at the moment, which actually left us. We couldn't live where we were living because it was too expensive. We knew we were going to have to move because there just wasn't any work where we were. Um, so I took a punt and that was my first stint being self-employed and we moved I don't know, I think it was like 200 miles west, actually, to the Welsh border, a town in the middle of nowhere with nothing going on bar um, this one project that my partner had been moved on to. Um, and it was great for cycling. That was wonderful. Like, <laughs> it's the best cycling I've ever done. But it, it was terrifying because you're, you're in a global pandemic. Everyone's telling you how hard it is to find work and you don't have a job. Um, mm. But yeah you gotta you make of each situation what you can and yeah. we had nothing else to do but train and find bits of work where we could and yeah made most of it for sure in that moment did you did you think like oh i'm gonna go be a professional triathlete not in the slightest no um i i think throughout my life confidence has been like a major sticking point like i'm the last person to believe in what i'm capable of doing um, so for me, all COVID was, was just like a wonderful opportunity to just train again and not feel like I was being pulled in a million different directions, having to travel and go into the office every day and stuff like that. So it was just uninterrupted time for me to do exactly what I wanted and, and loved doing. Um, it was after the Portugal win that I was like, oh, you know what, maybe I could. Mm -hmm. And it was that was just the that was just the like the first spark of fire, and over the next like year and a bit, it really started to grow until kind of beginning of twenty three. That I was like, now nah, this is definitely this is a hundred percent what I want to do, and I believe that I can do it. Don't know how good I could be at it, but we're mm -hmm. going to give everything I can to to get there. So it was a. It was a slow burn for sure, but it was it was definitely never part of the plan because I still had in my head like oh, I'm gonna I've grown up now <laughs> I've grown up now I'm in a proper job <laughs> and and this is where I'm going to spend the rest of my life I wouldn't imagine that I'd be willingly leaving leaving that working world a couple of years later to to embark on this one. <laughs> yeah, well, and can you talk about your rise in? as like a cyclist and a runner real quick, because obviously mm. swimming background, when did you start riding and running? So cycling actually was a huge part of my rowing training. 
Um, with my, my, my back injury had occurred within six months of me starting rowing. So my kind of five, six year career was um, marred by the fact that I actually couldn't do a lot of rowing because my back would spasm quite frequently. Um, and so I did a lot of my aerobic work on a bike, uh, not cycling outside, but on a static walk bike in the gym. So I'm pretty good at <laughs> riding inside with the monotony of just staring at a screen. Um, so I, um, I guess rowing is it's very leg dominant and it's very aerobic. So it's really suited to cycling. And you look at that. There's been quite a few rowers that have come across to cycling. And then it, you look at, well, I think it's the Ineos um, boat at the, in the moment in the um, Britannia, is it Britannia Cup, the America's Cup, that they've got like four GB rowers in there. So, you know, rowing mm. makes you good at cycling. Running, I um, avoided running like the plague, <laughs> I think is probably the best way to put it. Um, I never did it ever. I, like maybe as a kid when you were forced to do cross country at school, but I hated it. I didn't understand it. It wasn't a movement that made sense to me. Um, I did it when I had to playing hockey, but mm. it was never something I committed to. Like I never did running sessions. So when I started to do this Ironman training, I literally, I had to start off with doing a kilometer mm. and building up from there. Like that was the, and my first run, my heart rate hit over 200 <laughs> and I must have been going like six minute kilometers which is super humbling because at that point I was only a week out of rowing like so I was really fit yeah <laughs> I just couldn't run and I couldn't figure it out and it's it's been a, like it's been a journey and it's certainly one that we're still working on because I've spent my entire athletic career either lying down or sitting on my ass. <laughs> so the fact that I've had to stand up and move mm -hmm. is, um, yeah, it's new and it's frustrating as anything. And I get it and I get it so wrong. And then we get it so right. And sometimes it doesn't really make sense, but it's it's been really rewarding to properly go back to basics and learn about something that you're not that good at because then you get good at it much quicker. Well, and it's, uh, there's some coordination involved, you know, yeah. <laughs> 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 um, and I, I did see on, I believe it was Instagram a few weeks ago, you, you did mention like, you know, you're tweaking your form, you've been changing mm -hmm. up a bit, like walk through that whole process. Cause it's almost like you've over the last couple of years have been learning to run from the ground up, you know, you ran mm -hmm. K for the first time, it sounds like four years ago. And so like walk us through just like what what does changing your form look like at a as a 28, 29, 30 year old? Yeah, um painful is what it looks like. It's certainly what it feels like. So I guess I when I first started to run, I was like a sponge which is not necessarily a good thing when people are giving you opinions all over the place. And I had just heard that running on your toes was better for you than heel striking. So that just stuck in my head and I started running on my toes, um, which is great if you're a sprinter, right? <laughs> it's much less good <laughs> when you're training for an Ironman. <laughs> Um, but because it just requires much more energy but it was a movement pattern that I that was like the fundamental movement pattern that we that I learned to run with so basically the last two years has been trying to unpick that mm -hmm. and in unpicking that it's been unpicking the entire leg movement and then my foot placement as it hits the floor and then my knee drive and then my heel flick and then what my pelvic position is doing and then what my shoulders are doing and it's like you change one thing and then something else comes up. And mm -hmm. it's, this is where it gets infuriating because you're like, oh, I, I thought I made progress and now I feel like I've gone backwards. Mm -hmm. um, but that, so I think that's that's been the number one is the, the shift from literally running on my tiptoes to being a uh, midfoot strike. Um, but also something that I had realized very very recently so I I would like to think that this is why I ran so well in Chattanooga but um I 
had realized that my pelvis was basically in completely the wrong position and mm. where my back injury in the past had meant that I was guarding my spine quite a lot mm. um and over utilizing like my quads and my abs because I didn't I basically curled my pelvis underneath me you can't run like that because your glutes then don't engage so I have learned to walk again with my pelvis in the right position wow. so that my hips are staying sta stable so that I can actually use my glutes when I run, which is like, it's mind boggling, but it, it's clearly making a difference. Um, but this is the granularity that we've had to go to, to like undo some of the less helpful movement patterns that I've managed to pick up over the last like six years. <laughs> well, yeah. And I, I mean, learning, like running sounds like a simple thing, right? Mm -hmm. Like just got kids do it, just go out and run. But, exactly. I, <laughs> but there are so many nuances to it as well. Who did you have like looking at your form? Was it a coach, a physio? Like who helped you through this whole process? A, a combination of, of both actually. So um, I was working from with the physio from like a literally a physiological standpoint. So mm. is there anything about how my body works that is preventing me from moving in the way that I need to move? Um, and then I had two two particular people that were one was my main coach who kind of we were sending video I mean I feel for him his phone has got so many videos of me running <laughs> and just being like what's this look like how's this doing um and then there was another individual who just passed comment about my back not absorbing any loading and that for me was like a oh okay wow like that makes sense like yeah of course it's not absorbing any loading because I'm trying to make sure it isn't yeah, Which you're guarding like, it. Yeah, exactly. I'm preventing it from doing it because I don't want it to hurt. Um, so they're kind of the people. But I also have just watched so many videos and so many videos of people doing run drills and and trying to broaden my horizon from like, this is how you should run into this is the way that so many different people run. Mm -hmm. And it's all about finding the movement that is like the most freeing for you, but is equally yeah. the most efficient so that you can get to the last like 3k in a marathon in an Ironman. <laughs> yeah. And keep the same form. And yeah, exactly. Form, right? <laughs> um, I'm just kind of curious on this whole process. Cause well, like you said, I, everybody can run differently, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's not just like a one size fits all. I feel like, you know, I, when I was growing up, it was always like, you know, it's not good to be a heel striker. Uh, yeah. You need to be on the balls of your feet. Um, but that's even changed a little bit recently where it's just like, it doesn't matter as much. It's more so one about the form that works for you, but then also just making sure it's more being a heel, heel striker is more uh, a problem if you're just reaching too far. Right. Yeah. But if you're landing in the right place, it doesn't matter as much where you're striking. Um, anyway, I'm not an expert in this field, so I'm going to stop right there. But <laughs> all that to say is like, where, like, did you, your physio coach, like, it's one thing just to kind of change your run form to make it feel good. You, you said you worked from like the ground up. Was there a lot of like strength involved with that as well? Like obviously you're, you needed your glutes to fire for the first time when you ran. So yeah. what, what, what was that whole process like? I'm just kind of curious. Like, yeah, the, the, the strength-based training is um, one that I have accepted that will be a part of my life. I think anyone that has had um, a chronic back injury will know that strength is probably the only thing that actually makes the pain go away um, in the long term. So keeping my my core, my glutes, my back, like everything working supple and firing is the only way that I can prevent the constant pins and needles in my left foot from the nerve damage that I've done. So. Mm. And it's something that I, I know, and that doesn't necessarily mean I do it all the time. <laughs> and there was a period of time where I think I rejected it because I didn't want to feel like I had had an injury that had been so life-defining. But it is a part of my program, and I do now for the last, like, well, absolutely all this year have been doing at least two strength sessions a week. Um, 
it's different to when I was rowing. When I was rowing, it was like, okay, let's get really strong and rip as many pairs of jeans as you can because your quads are growing so much. Whereas now it's much more around that strength endurance that's like, okay, you need to be able to maintain form under intense fatigue. So you need your muscles to be pretty robust to manage that. Um, and the first thing for me that goes, and, and not goes as in switches off, but goes as in has a stress response and becomes painful is my back. So I need to make sure that it feels strong and feels robust and feels like it can fire for nine, nine hours, um, yeah. which is quite a long time. Yeah. Yeah. And with the fatigue factor, right? There, there's, yeah. that's a long time to fatigue. Um, so a lot of swimmers that have just spent most of their young childhood growing up in a pool, their teenage years growing up in a pool, like coming into a triathlon and getting the appropriate run volume needed to compete mm. at a high level is a fairly common story. Like what has been your experience with the whole, the, the volume side of things? We've been so careful. I think like the, the privilege that I have in following in the footsteps of the likes of Lucy Charles Barclay is that we can see how she managed it. Mm -hmm. And then, tweak as needed um and knowing that I have had a an injury in the past has meant that you know we we have been really careful so I think last year as well as an age group I was only running at like three hours a week um maybe three and a half whereas this year we're we're up at four and a half maybe five so I'm I'm not running a lot mm -hmm. really um when you look at you know whoever saying they're running kind of seven, eight hours a week. Like that's not, that's not what I'm doing, but what I am making sure that I'm doing is everything is very intentional and it's fully focused because it's not that I'm not fit and running more won't necessarily get me fitter. All it could do is just get me injured. Whereas what we need to do is make sure that my body is conditioned to take the run load. And I get, I actually get the majority of my volume in from swimming because I can swim loads without getting injured. <laughs> yeah. does, your back then, bother, does your back bother you at all when you're swimming these days, like your rowing no, injuries? Not at all, okay. um, which is great. And it actually hasn't ever. So even when I even when I was in the acute phase of the in injury, swimming was one of the few things that completely alleviated the pressure. And I think it's just the body position was slightly different, hmm. um, which was great because that's quite nice. <laughs> <laughs> it is nice. Um, I do want to talk about Chattanooga a little bit, um, mm. but before before we do that, so can you, what was your first, if you remember it, what was your first, was it 2020, 2021? What was your first marathon time at the end of an Ironman? Uh, 2019, and it was 420, 425, four 425. hours. Five. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so Chattanooga, mm -hmm. you have a big run PR. Yes. You run 3 0, was it? 3 0 5. 3 0 5. Yeah. Like you mentioned, you know, again, I'm learning a lot of this for the first time too, but and that's only on, off a four and a half hour or a week mm -hmm. of run volume. What are, what are like the plans kind of going forward with running? Is it to keep slowly increasing the run volume? Is it, hey, you're doing great where you're at? Let's focus on different things within that four and a half hour. So I think it like w of the three disciplines, the running is the one that is lowest. If you compare, like if you compare it across the board to how other people train, the run is the lowest. Um, which isn't necessarily a bad thing because we're all different and we all need different things. But it's honestly, the three hundred five was a shock. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like it's not something that I expected. Um, and the approach that we're taking is how quick can you get on the volume of training that you're currently doing and then you can increase it and then you can get faster. And that's not to say that you have to train loads to get faster, but what we didn't want to happen was, Oh, okay. You're a full-time professional athlete. Now you've got all the time in the world. Let's ramp the training up to 30 hours and run eight hours a week. And then mm -hmm. you can't do any more. Whereas we're seeing this as a progression that's like, okay, my training has in total gone up from about 15 hours to about 19, 20 hours. Let's do that. 
and see how good we can get. And then we step up again and you're just basically pushing the plateau out a little bit because it happens to everyone when mm-hmm. your body adapts and then you need to find another way to get some performance gains. Um so I have touch wood stayed injury free on the current run volume, which means that hopefully through winter with the strength training, we'll be able to nudge it up a little bit more. Um, and I actually think more than anything, it will be introducing more quality as opposed to more time. Um, just because I honestly, I was, I couldn't, I wasn't running efficiently enough to be able to execute run sessions. Mm. I was just getting so tired from trying to hit paces that, I should have been able to hit, you know, last year, early last year, around a 124 half marathon, which isn't, it's not awful. It's, it's pretty good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then, but I couldn't get anywhere close to half marathon race pace and training. Mm. So it just wasn't making sense. Like it wasn't making sense. Whereas now I'm able to run efficiently enough that I can actually execute run sessions. So we'll sit here for a little bit and then we can say, okay, well, we can, we can either run more or we can do some more quality, but it probably won't be both at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a super mature approach to take to training. Um, and it's really cool to hear your thoughts behind that process. Um, what, so okay, also curious, like why did you, most athletes, whether they're pros or age groupers, I mean, they do start using lever system because they're injured. Um, you know, helps them come back from the injury. And then, you know, they realize, Hey, this actually has a place while I'm healthy as well. You kind of started in the, I'm already healthy camp. So like, why did you incorporate it in the first place? Like what made you think it was a good idea to start supplementing some of your runs? So in my mind, I needed to run more without running more. I think Mm -hmm. it's, I don't know how else to explain it. Like all I needed to ingrain was better movement patterns and then it's like all about habit forming and we all know that the best way to form a habit is to do the action more frequently but with running when you're running at full body weight like the injury risk increases exponentially with it um whereas with the lever system i can run more without running more Mm -hmm. but i can reduce my body weight and therefore reduce the risk of injury so when i was looking at okay, I need to be able to do more strides. I need to be able to run more. Like literally my feet need to be able to hit the ground more, but I need to reduce the like the, the load that's going through my body so that it's that isn't increasing throughout the week. But the amount of strides that I'm taking is increasing throughout the week. The only way to do that is to reduce body weight, which I can't do. Like I'm not just going to be able to drop seven kilos, <laughs> seven kilos so that... <laughs> I have less load in my joints because that in itself isn't healthy. Um, so that's that's where I was. It's kind of that I need to be able to form habits. I need to be able to do this movement more frequently, but also I want to stay injury free. Um, and yeah, that's why it was a, a tool that was just compelling to me. And I felt like this is this is this is the solution to the problem that I'm currently facing. Yeah. Can you give us just a quick example of what that looks like in a week of how you yeah. incorporate it? So, it, I mean, it's different week to week, but easy runs, um, I I would use the lever for because I can just, you know, I, the day after a hard run or if I've had a hard bike, I can get on and use it and fully focus on, okay, how is my foot hitting the floor? I mean, with that granular, how is my foot hitting the floor? Yeah. What is my cadence like? Like that, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, or after what we have noticed is actually using it after a race. Um, I can start running much sooner because one of my fears is that I'm going to forget. I'm going to forget how to run if I take like a week off after a race from running, which typically is what you'd kind of have to do after running a marathon um, is you give yourself time to heal. Whereas I can start running a few days earlier Mm. so I could get like two runs in that week rather than just the one. And it's like, okay, so I've, I've ingrained the movement patterns in this day and then I'm back to running on this day. Um, and then another one would be just before traveling to a race, doing some like fast strides with it where I don't want to have the loading necessarily of running way quicker than race pace for too long, but I can get myself on the lever. I can get my legs turning over really nice and fast and I can get things firing without, without adding too much loading. 
Yeah, no, that's good. So after I'm in Chattanooga, mm-hmm. what what was your first when was your first run back? First run back was Thursday. Okay, and I'm so, pretty sure it was about ten minutes, and I had the lever, and it was like a number one check: nothing hurts that shouldn't hurt. Um, which I mean, everything was hurting still <laughs> by that point, but it was all expected. And then it was yeah, just like okay, this is. This is how this is how I run, and it felt slow compared to how I'd run the marathon. So that was also nice. <laughs> that is good. Yeah, super impressive. So let's go get into Chattanooga then for mm-hmm. a few minutes here. So, um, <clears throat> so you're flying in from the UK, I'm guessing, mm-hmm. into pretty much a hurricane. Yeah, a lot of people are still recovering from that many weeks later, um, which is really sad. But so you fly in into Chattanooga. Um, swims canceled like real real early as a swimmer with a swim background, like what, what were your thoughts? Like, how do you prepare for a race like that? Yeah. So it was, it was actually, yeah, it was, it was one of those moments that puts everything into perspective because we'd, we'd seen that there was a hurricane coming from the UK. So we flew out on the Wednesday, I think it was, or the Tuesday. Um, so it was way before it hit landfall, but we, we saw that it was going to be bad. And you kind of like, well, I want to go because it doesn't look like it's going to hit Chattanooga yet, which is fantastic. Um, mm-hmm. But then part of you's like, is this irresponsible? But we made the decision to go. And it became clear when we were there that it it was not it was not going to take the path that they typically would and go north and then out to sea. It was actually going to come inland, which is super rare. Um, mm-hmm. And it was it was all of a sudden a category five, and you're seeing on the news what it's doing to Florida, and it was horrendous. But well, one, it was terrifying. We don't get hurricanes in the UK, and we have no idea. We have no idea what's coming. Um, but also just to see see the devastation that was hitting, and you're like, I I do not I do not have the right to feel worried about the race when there are people that are having their lives kind of ripped up and apart. And I think at that point. Um, so by the, I think it was by the day, the day after we landed, we knew that the race wasn't going to run as we expected it to. So we hadn't heard anything yet, but just looking at what was coming and looking at the weather forecast, like it wasn't, it wasn't going to be safe to do a swim and it quite possibly wasn't going to be safe to race. So it was, we, we kind of knew that, mm-hmm. like we, we can't be blind as athletes like we have to be aware of what's going on and you can't you can't ignore a hurricane when it's barreling its way through Mm -hmm. a country towards you and we were very fortunate that it did change direction ever so slightly and went round Chattanooga so Chattanooga wasn't hit Uh, we just had some utterly insane winds for about half a day and quite a lot of rain but the surrounding area was devastated um, especially up kind of north to Nashville Um, so they they made an amazing decision to cancel the race really to cancel the swim sorry really early mm-hmm. which meant that it gave us time to plan and mm-hmm. yeah it was really I, I as a former swimmer I don't like turning up to races when the swim's cancelled and quite often I'll make sure that if I'm picking a race have they had swims cancelled in the past because I'd quite like to swim. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a triathlete like I want to do all three and swimming is swimming is my best bit. Um, but I couldn't do anything about it. So there was mm-hmm. there was no point being annoyed. There was no point being stressed. It was then all about, okay, so how are we going to bike for 180K and then run a marathon as fast as we can? Um, there are pros and cons to there not being a swim. Uh, the pros being that my body temperature is down starting the bike. My heart rate's down starting the bike. I've got 50-odd minutes less exercise in my body by the time I'm starting the bike. So you take all of that and you're like, okay, how can we have the best bike run possible? Um, And that's, that's what we kind of spent two days planning basically when we were there, Um, made some slight changes. Like I was able to, (laughs) this sounds really silly. I was able to uh, plait my hair slightly differently so that it could sit up in my TT helmet um, Mm. rather than not, because you couldn't, I couldn't have done that with a swimming hat on. Um, So it's just a little bit more aerodynamic. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's good. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, exactly like you made the most of what you've got i know uh joe skipper had a full 
like time trial race suit on on the bike, which I did not. I just wore my tri suit, but I did wear socks, and I don't normally wear socks on the bike. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, yeah, it saves a few seconds in in transition to have to put them on yeah. for the run. Um, how did you feel it during the bike? I I felt amazing, and we laugh about it because. I my two best races this year it's been 20 degrees celsius I have no idea what that is in fahrenheit sorry and raining yeah, um I'll look it up. and that's it that's what it was in chattanooga and it was it was so unexpected but it was just it's the conditions and the temperature that my body loves so I felt really good um the rain kept me nice and cool um it was gritty. It was hard. It was busy. It was pretty sketchy with all the age groupers on there from for lap two and three. But it was just one of those. It just felt like one of those races that rewarded you just like really knuckling down and getting on with it. Um, yeah. Like it was on a highway. <laughs> and, you know, it's just one of those like, yeah, we just have to get like get down, get on with it and ride really hard. Um, and I felt great. And m- my plan had always been ride the first lap quite hard take a breath when all the age groupers come onto the course and get around everyone safely. And then from the turnaround back into town, really turn the screw um, and push on and make the gaps come out, uh, blow out a little bit. And yeah, I, I managed it and it was, it was awesome. And um, I had been under strict instructions not to ride too hard um, <laughs> because I'd ridden a bit too hard in Victoria in July and, had overheated and then suffered on the run. So the plan was don't ride too hard so you can run fast. And when I got off the bike and I saw how hard I'd ridden, I was like, oh dear, I'm going to have to run exceptionally well. Otherwise I am never going to hear the end of this. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, Um, because you also didn't have a swim under you. So you probably felt just fresh and ready to go. Yeah, it was wonderful. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. So 68 degrees is 20 degrees Celsius. So nice cool day mm-hmm. for a triathlon um a little more like uk weather maybe yes it felt like at home um with the time trial start did you know where you were the entire race um or was that difficult to keep track of it so we we'd looked at the start beforehand to know where like the key players were um so i knew i knew where the people were ahead of me no idea where anyone was behind mm. um and so I was just hoping that no one came on the bike, came back, came past me from behind because I'd have no idea who they were or how far they had started behind me. Whereas in front, I think I know it was just much easier to keep an eye on who yeah. who was in front and where they were. And Sarah True and Haley Chura were up ahead, and they were in my eyes the absolute favourites for the race. So you kind of you, you're like, okay, I think Sarah was five minutes up and Haley was three and a half. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's like, okay, I just need to like. I know where they are. Um, and on the bike, it kind of didn't matter because we're like, it was, it was a, a fast course. We we're all going very quickly. Um, but it was on the run that it was like utterly insane mental mathematics, trying to figure out like who was where and what on earth was going to happen. And yeah, Sarah came past at about 10 K, but she was still five minutes behind me. I was like, this is really weird. <laughs> This is really trippy. That is trippy. Yeah. And then, um, so I guess you felt great on the bike. Mm-hmm. Felt good on the run. You had to run fast. Yeah. So I had you- to run fast. No choice. <laughs> so, but you did because you had a big PR. Yes. For the marathon. 13 minutes? What was? Um, 305 to 17 minutes. 17, 17 minutes. minutes. Yeah. Big, big PR then. Big PB, yeah. Um, yeah, like, what were you thinking that whole race? So you come through halfway on a pretty solid pace. Yeah. Way under PB time. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> so funnily enough, um, I looked at my watch twice the whole run, um, wow. which is not normal. I mean, it's similar to the bike. Like I wasn't really looking at my power and I didn't really look at my run speed. Um and I think it's one of those things when you're feeling good, you don't want to, you don't want to know. Whereas when you're feeling bad, you're checking constantly like, Oh God, is it that bad? Like, <laughs> when are we going to finish? Yeah. Um, 
And I just, I just was in this like completely Zen flow state where the world seemed to cease to exist. Mm. And I was just running and I was focusing on the, the sound of my feet hitting the floor. And I knew that I was taking on a gel every three miles. So I was just counting down in threes to each board as it was coming past. Um, and the course in Chattanooga is actually, it's really good for mental stimulations. The first bit's flat, fast, slightly boring. And I would imagine if it's hot, it's absolute hell because it's quite exposed. Mm. Um, but you've got, so you've got 13K of flat and then you've got about 8K of hilly. So you kind of, you just break it down in that and that's then times two. Um, so you like the course is split into four for you. So you just work through that. And yeah, the first first half felt great. Um, I checked my, my watch once about 3K in and saw a 405. And I was like, I'm just going to ignore that and pretend I didn't see it because that's <laughs> so much faster than I should be running. But we're I just don't want to know. And then I checked it around the half marathon point and it was the fastest half marathon I've run off the bike. Um, cause I've never actually gone sub 130 in a half. I've never, uh, I've just not managed it, um, off the bike and I ran a 131. So, you know, it was, it was, yeah, officially my fastest half marathon and my fastest marathon off the bike. Um, and I just, that they were my two watch checks and I just kept mm-hmm. going and I just kept running because check, I was just like checking your watch isn't going to make everyone else slow down. So you're just going to have to keep running. You're going to have to keep running anyway. <laughs> just keep going. It'll be fine. Um, yeah. What what part of the race or what part of the run did you know you were in the position you wanted to be in? Uh, never. Um, <laughs> not until you finished. <laughs> no, not until I finished. It's an awful feeling being being hunt, like being hunted down, and it's mm. like. So I, I knew Sarah had gone past, and she as soon as she was out of sight, I tried to kind of forget. Uh, and she didn't take the lead until about 25k but there was no chance I was going to be running with Seth like she's just so she's just utterly excellent um and like we say I shouldn't have been running a 305 so I know Sarah runs like sub 255 quite consistently so it's like there's just there's no competition um but I knew that there were some other utterly fantastic runners that were behind me, which is why I'd ridden my bike so hard because I had to get a lead. I needed one. Mm-hmm. Um, and Anna Marie came past at 7K to go. So just as the up the hill, up the first hill on the hilly section. And I was like, okay, she's four and a half minutes behind me right now because she'd gone off second. Um, that's okay. You just have to be able to see her. And it's not okay. And then you've got it. Because I can't time four and a half minutes. At this point, I'm like 35k mm-hmm. deep into an Ironman. I barely <laughs> yeah, I'm <thinking> straight. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what's going on. By no four and a half minutes is a kilometer. Um, so I, I was just staring at her. I was just staring at her. <laughs> it's just really weird. I'm slightly <laughs> creepy, but I was just watching her. I'm just being like, do not let her out of your sight. Um, and she stayed in sight until about 500 meters to go going over the last bridge and at that point like she'd only just gone out of sight so in theory I probably should have known that I was going to come second I basically convinced myself that she'd run like a two minute final kilometer and uh that was it she'd take a second and I was going to come in third um so I just didn't like until I was on the red carpet and someone said it's yours like Mm. you just I don't know I just couldn't let myself believe it because anything could happen and anything really can happen in an Ironman. Um, So I just ran as hard as I could until the last step, basically, which Mm. um, is great because I've never been able to do that before in an Ironman marathon. Yeah. Like really rewarding. (laughs) Yeah. Well, you know, you you talked about confidence before and I hope that this race gave you the confidence because you do belong where you're racing. Thank you. And I'm excited to see, I mean, you're only 10 months in as a pro and you've come so far already Mm -hmm. and it's going to be really fun to keep watching where you go from here um the other big thing second place got you a place at kona next year yeah really it's huge it's huge congratulations thank you yeah we um it was kind of it was a it was a pipe dream 
to get a Kona slot. After I missed out on Nice, we were like, okay, well, I definitely want a Kona slot for next year. Let's see if we can get it wrapped up by this year. And um, then the swim was cancelled and you're kind of like, oh, okay, you know, that that's going to be an even bigger ask because that, I'm, I'm missing my best bit and I have to perform with these utterly excellent women. Like, that's a huge ask. And I did it. So I'm going to Kona next year. Like, Huge. it's just so exciting. <laughs> Huge. Yeah. Hopefully you celebrated that one pretty big. Yes, yeah. And and we'll continue to. I think the the end of season celebration is going to be a big one because it's it's actually quite rare in a season that you take off everything that you've wanted to do. Um, mm. And we have. So, so that's really yeah. cool. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, no, that's really cool. Uh, so what is left for the season? So I'm racing 70.3 Portugal this weekend. Um, bit of an experiment, kind of. It will be three races in six weeks, um, just to see see how my body holds up. We think next year is going to be quite busy, so we kind of want to test it. And I think, all being well, I'll be doing 70.3 Indian Wells in the begin the beginning of December, and that will be end of my season. End of your season. Okay. Mm-hmm. Very good. It's a lot. Of, it's very exciting. Uh, well, cool. What's the best way for people to follow what you're doing? Obviously, the end of this year and then into next year as a as you're going to be ramping up for a big Kona year. Yeah. So uh, Instagram is definitely the best place to get me. I'm at Steph Clusterbuck. I share pretty much everything on there. Um, and I have also been informed that we will be restarting my YouTube channel, but we have said that so many times <laughs> <laughs> and have yet to execute. So Instagram is definitely uh, the most reliable way to follow along. Awesome. You know, and I, I recommend every, we'll, we'll link your Instagram in, in the show notes for sure. Um, and I want everyone just to go now and see your new run form because it looks great. Your run form Thank looks you. so good. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> is it where you want it to be? Like, are you guys like set and now it's just, let's get mile kilometers under your legs <laughs> at this point to like make sure this stays consistent or. Yeah, I think so. so. It's consolidating what we've done and making sure that it's stuff that my brain remembers. And then maybe end of the season, we'll go and get some like biomechanics testing done just to check that we're not wasting any energy anywhere. Um, but Hopefully, from this point, it's just tweaking rather than completely stripping it down and starting again because that was exhausting. <laughs> <laughs> well, it looks good to me. So, um, you know. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's good. Um, well, awesome. Thank you so much for coming on, Steph. It was awesome to talk to you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. And good luck at Portugal this weekend. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for listening to today's episode. If you're interested in learning more about incorporating the lever system into your training, follow us on Instagram at lever movement, or even follow me on Strava to learn how I incorporate lever into my training for ultras. Until next time, keep running.